Good morning, everybody. So glad to see everyone here this morning, even though you saw my name on the list to speak this morning. Growing up, I was always fascinated with sports, always wanted to be involved in sports. I didn't play football. That was my parents' decision. They didn't want me to get hurt. It was probably a good idea. I was not very big. I was not very strong. I was not very fast. And after watching my son play a couple seasons, I'm really glad I did not play football in high school. Um, baseball was not a sport that I was well coordinated for. Um, I'm not great at throwing. I'm not great at catching. I'm not great at hitting my target. Usually it's a target way off to the left or to the right when I throw the ball. And I realized that I can't even hit a slow pitch ball in baseball. I've been to the cages. As soon as the ball passes, then I swing, and that's a slow pitch. So baseball was not a sport that I was able to play. I did start playing softball in high school. I've been playing softball for more than 20 years, and it took that long just to be an average softball player. I learned my weaknesses. I learned how to keep my eyes down when I bat, keep my eyes down when I throw. And lucky for me, the ball is coming very slow, so I'm actually able to hit it at the plate. Um, I did play basketball some, elementary, junior high, high school. I was an okay defensive player. I was really good at fouling. But if you gave me the ball, I had no idea what to do with it. I could barely dribble with my right hand. I could not dribble with my left hand. And if I actually took a shot, I'd be lucky if it came close to the basket. Um, and Tommy Johnson, a couple years ago, got his knees hurt. I told him, I think I can take you now. So basketball was not, not something I was very good at. Um, so I ended up running track and field a lot in junior high and high school. And I did a variety of events. I did a couple field events. I tried the long jump, and I tried the triple jump. The long jump, I would barely make it into the sand. You had to be a little bit faster and taller and stronger to do it. The triple jump is more like advanced hopscotch with three leaps, and I was lucky if I could get to the sand. So I, I didn't do very well with that one. I did, uh, I've run the 100-meter dash. I've run the 200-meter dash. More often than not, I was usually last place. If you've ever run the 200-meter, you start on the curve, and you're staggered. You're not actually all lined up together. And I remember one race, I was starting in the first lane, so I'm starting what appears to be the farthest one back, which is good because I don't like it when people pass me because um, I ended up being last anyway. So that was okay. I, and uh, there was one track meet. The coach decided, okay, you four guys, you're going to go run the 1,600-meter relay. Uh, 1,600 meters, that's one mile, four laps, and each guy runs one lap. We'd never practiced it. He just found four guys that hadn't maxed out on their events and said, you guys are going to go run this race. And it wouldn't have been so bad had he not picked our one guy who all he did was shot, put, and discus. He was not a runner. So we ran the race. The first guy goes around. The second guy goes around. And we're kind of keeping up with everybody until the shot putter ran the third leg. And we came in very far toward the end. By the time I got the baton as the last guy, the other teams were about finishing the race. And, of course, we're all just like, why didn't the world did the coach put us all together for this race? Um, I actually ran hurdles in high school. Uh, I did the 300 meter, which wasn't too bad. I did the 110 high hurdles. And for a short guy, you don't run the 110 high hurdles. Because technically, as short as I was, I couldn't actually hurdle a hurdle. I had to jump over a hurdle. So more often than not, you watch me run, 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 they almost stop and just kind of hop over the hurdle because that's about all I can do with being as short as I was. I did, however, take third place at district, which I was really proud of. I knew I was going to get that medal. Like, I've worked hard. I'm going to get this medal. And when you walk up to the start line and there's only three people running the race, you know for a fact, all I got to do if I finish, I'm going to get a medal at district. So that was, that, and I still have that today. I'm very proud of that medal. <laughs> of all the races that I ran in track and field, the one I absolutely hated the most was the 800 meter run. And in my opinion, the 800 meter is in a class all by itself. You have the sprints, the 100 meter, the 200 meter, the 400 meter. They're, they're, they're sprints. You get there, you go as fast as you can, you get to the finish line. You have the distance races, which usually start at a mile and go up from in distance from that. And that when you have to pace yourself, you have to set a good pace, that way you've got energy at the end to finish. The 800 meter is somewhere in between. It's only two laps, it's half a mile. You can't sprint it 
but you can't run it slow either. And for a guy that went out for sports but didn't try that hard, never ever should have been running the 800 meter run. And I remember running this only one time, and I remember being at the start line. We're all lined up, we're not everybody's in their lanes because there's too many of us, we're all just shoulder to shoulder on the start line. We're ready to go, the starter pulls the trigger on the gun and we all take off. I had a bad habit of not being able to run at the pace I want to run at, but instead run at the pace that everybody else runs at. So as the race starts, of course the guys who are faster than me start taking off at their pace and I start pacing myself with them, which was ultimately going to uh, lead to my demise in the whole race. So I'm running at their pace, which I'm not able to do. And, and I remember starting off and I'm kind of at the back of the pack, I'm keeping up. And that's when, um, I don't remember really the next lap or so, but I remember getting through lap one and now we're on lap two. And I'm on lap two, I'm on the far side of the track, I'm about halfway through on the back straightaway. And at this point, I'm completely by myself. I am not moving very fast. It almost looks like I'm running a long distance race or maybe a fast walk, jogging in place, but I'm actually moving a little bit forward at a time. I'm not moving very fast. Everybody else has already finished. I'm the only guy left on the track. And I'm back there and I'm running it and I'm hurting and I'm dying and I'm just thinking in my mind, why in the world did I pick the 800 meter run? And it's just like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be out here. And I'm, I just wanted to quit. And I'm, I'm at the edge of the track. Over to my left, I can see the grass, the infield, because it's around a, around a football field. And I'm thinking in my mind, all I got to do is take one step to my left, and I'm done. I can take a step to my left. I can lay down. I can drop. And I can be done with this. I don't have to go all the way back around. Because in my mind, nobody else even remembers that I'm on the track. Because on the other side of the track, people are just coming and going as though the race was over. Nobody noticed that there's this one kid um, close to death on the other side of the track and I don't even remember how far behind I really was I don't remember when the other ones finished it seemed like forever but I'm just barely moving working my way up to that final curve and I just keep looking to my left at the grass and all I want to do is quit all I want to do is step off of that track and be done with this race because I just I don't want to run it anymore I'm tired I'm hurting and I just want to quit. And nobody else ever even seems to notice that I'm even there. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at uh, Peter. Some things about Peter. Peter is one of those that we all know that the apostles likes to jump right in, likes to, like to really get involved and get out there. And I want to look at a few instances with Peter in, relationship, in his interactions with Jesus. Uh, in Luke 5, verses 1 through 11, we read about Jesus calling the first of the apostles. Uh, the, Peter has been in a boat. He's been fishing all night long. They have caught nothing. He's an experienced fisherman. He knows how to fish. He knows where to go. He knows the right time of day to go. And here comes this guy that tells him, try, try your nets again. Throw it to the other side of the boat. Try it again. And when you read the passage, Peter's just saying, we, we've been doing this all night. But because you say so, I'll do it again. But I kind of wonder what he's thinking at the, this moment. He's an experienced fisherman. He knows what he's doing. And here comes this random stranger up telling him how to do his job that he is well experienced at. And then sure enough, they catch this, this whole load of fish. And you've got to wonder, how in the world does this guy on the shoreline who tells us to throw our nets to the other side, how does he know how to do this better than me? And I wonder if there's a little bit of frustration with Peter at that point. If you move forward, you go to Matthew 14, you read about Jesus walking on the water. And in this particular account, we get to read about Peter walking on the water. They're out on the sea, the, the winds are up, the waves are up, the boat's getting tossed about. And they see what they believe to be at first a ghost walking across the water, but in fact it's Jesus. And they're scared. And then Peter calls out to him and says, if, you, if, if it is you tell me to come and Jesus tells him to come out and Peter gets out of the boat and you got to give Peter credit for having the guts to get out of the boat and of course we all know the story he starts walking and then eventually he starts seeing the, the waves and everything crashing around him and he starts to sink and then Jesus has to come and pull him out and I wonder what Peter might have been thinking at that point the fact that I'm out there I'm doing this and all of a sudden I can't do it and Jesus has to come and, and get me and, and, and 
pull me out of this water that I'm sinking in, that I, just a second ago I was walking on. I, I wonder if he was a little bit frustrated with the fact that he couldn't do it. If you look at Matthew, Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, Jesus is talking to the apostles, the apostles and he's, for, he's telling them about what's going to happen, about his death, his resurrection. He's telling them the future because, I mean, Jesus knows what's going to happen. He knows his purpose, and he's explaining this to the apostles. And after he tells them this, G, or, uh, Peter comes to them, to him, and says, this is not going to happen. We're not going to let this happen. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. If he was to say that to you, after you're telling Jesus, hey, I'm not going to let this happen to you, what do you think is probably going through your mind? I, I don't know about Peter, but in my own mind, I would just, I, I would be thrown way off guard. I would be very confused. And it's just like, why did you just basically say, get behind me, Satan, and you're looking at me as you say it? There's got to be some frustration there for Peter. And if you move forward, uh, John 18, 1 through 11, we read about the arrest of Jesus. And if you read the, that particular account, you know when they come to take Jesus, Peter's the one that draws his sword. And I do find it interesting that a fisherman is carrying a sword. He hits the ear of one of the servants. Um, probably not very skilled with it, probably meant to go for his head, but he hits the ear and cuts it off. And then Jesus tells him, this is not what's going to happen. Put the sword away. Peter's standing there trying to defend Jesus, and Jesus tells him not to do it. And there's got to be some confusion there. I'm trying to protect you, Jesus, but yet you're telling me not to do that. There's got to be confusion. What I don't understand what's going on. If you move forward, Luke 22 Verses 54 through 62 is an account of Peter denying Jesus three times. Jesus has already told him previously that he's going to do this. And this is one of the accounts that is recorded. And I picked this one for a particular reason. When you read through this account three times, Peter is asked, weren't you the one, one of the ones who was with him? And three times he denies it. Three times he says, I don't know this guy. I wasn't with him. Three times. And, of course, after the third time, the rooster crows. But in this particular account, it says, after the third time, the rooster crows, and Jesus turned and looked at him. Of all the things Peter's already had experience in his interactions with Jesus, from the frustrations of not really understanding what's going on and thinking he's doing the right thing when, in fact, it's, it's not, this has got to be one of his high, uh, low points. The man you've been following for three years. The man that you said you would not deny. You would not um, say you don't know him. You would, you're not going to leave him. Just turn and looked at you because you just did what you said you wouldn't do. And if you read in that account, it says Peter ran out and wept bitterly. He just doesn't seem to be able to get anything right. And even going on... Jesus is arrested, he's crucified, he's resurrected, and in John 21, 15 through 19, three times Jesus asks him the question, do you love me? He asks him the first time, and Peter says, yes I do. The second time, yes I do. Asks him a third time, and it says, Peter was getting frustrated. You've already asked me twice, why are you asking me a third time? And all those experiences that he had with not just any individual, but with Jesus, he never quit. He always came back and tried again. He came back and tried again. If you keep reading through Acts, he, he gets even better at it. He keeps being arrested, threatened, beaten, and he doesn't quit. All these times that, as I look at it, especially the one where he denied him and Jesus turned and looked, I don't know if I'd have come back from that one. That would be really tough. But he never quit. He kept moving forward. He kept looking to Jesus, and he kept moving forward. He never gave up. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And we're going to hear um, Peter speak here. 2 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, reads as, as this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence 
by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being an ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be you, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the kingdom, into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says in verse 10, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Sometimes we want to give up and we want to quit because we forget what it is we need to do in order to live a life that is a reflection of how God wants us to live it. Sometimes we don't practice some of these qualities that Peter talks about in order to live that life, and it causes us to stumble, it causes us to doubt, it causes us to look inside of that track as you're running and say, all i got to do is step off, and I can be done with dealing with all this, all this difficulty, all those trials that, that James chapter 1 talks about, that if you overcome them, you'll be stronger. And we hear looking at Peter's interaction with Jesus over three years and all the, the difficult times that Jesus and his difficult interactions they had where Peter thought he had it right and then come to find out he's not doing it right. He never gave up. And he talks about it himself right here in Second Peter. Here's some of the qualities you need. And if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And I like the way verse 11 words it. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. An entrance. Going home whenever God tells us it's our time. I'm on the far side of the track. I'm barely moving. I am hurting. I'm, it, it hurts to breathe. I am not prepared for this race. And I'm just trying to get to the end of it so it can be over with. Even though I'm looking at the side of that track and it's like that grass is looking pretty good right now. As much as I'm hurting. And I really contemplated just taking one step to my left and stepping off the track. And as I came to the last curve, I'm on the back straightaway. I'm starting the last curve going around and I hear a voice. A very loud voice that echoes throughout the area that I'm in. A guy coming over the loudspeaker saying, clear the track, clear the track, there's a runner on the track, clear the track. 